People don't understand nowadays what times were like back then. We just got over the dust storms and all the stuff and the, nobody could grow any crops and nobody had any money. I graduated from high school and the Navy recruiter was there and so I joined the Navy. They offered $21 a month to go in the Navy, so <laughs> that was quite a jump, you know. We uh, just happened to be assigned to the, to the Arizona. And I was a site setter in the port director, which was uh, one deck above the bridge. And of course, spent all of a, probably six months uh, in Pearl Harbor, out on maneuvers and uh, Firing uh, anti-aircraft guns, broadside guns, 14-inch guns, and it was just—it was just routine uh, practice. Uh, we have reveille every morning at 5:30, and we just finished chow at seven when the, the, the everything started to come loose. Went to get something out of my locker, and I picked up some oranges to take a buddy of mine and. But some sailors were hollering on the, yelling on the bow of the ship about doing something at, on Ford Island there. So I go up and take, check it out. And uh, sure enough, uh, one of the planes peeled away and I could see the big red Japanese insignia. And I knew it was the Japanese right away and they were bombing Ford Island. So I started for my battle station and up the ladders I went. I broke some locks on some of the ready boxes behind the guns to get some ammunition and we started firing at them. Hi, I'm Marty and welcome to the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia. The Smithsonian is home to many historic aircraft, including the Sikorsky JRS-1, which was at Pearl Harbor when the Japanese attacked on December 7th, 1941, which led the United States into World War II. I'm Beth and behind me is the Enola Gay, the aircraft which dropped the first atomic bomb used in combat on Hiroshima, Japan on August 6, 1945, leading to the end of World War II. Today, we're gonna to look at World War II, the Pacific Theater and victory over Japan. We are going to learn from oral histories and other primary sources and have a little help from our middle school friends across the country. We're gonna take you to several museums around the country and we encourage you to find museums and libraries and learning centers near you to learn more. To get us started, let's learn a little bit about how the United States entered World War II. On Sunday, December 7, 1941, shortly before 8 a.m., Japan launched a surprise attack on the United States of America by bombing the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The base was attacked by 350 Imperial Japanese aircrafts. Though the raid only lasted 75 minutes, the Japanese destroyed or damaged nearly 20 American naval vessels, including eight battleships and more than 340 airplanes. Over 2,400 Americans died in the attack, and many more were wounded. While the attack on Pearl Harbor was a surprise, tensions between the U.S. and Japan had deteriorated over the decade, in particular with regards to Japan's expansion into China. The plan for attacking Pearl Harbor was to destroy the U.S.'s Pacific Fleet, a move which would give the Japanese time to carry out its plans to keep control of the Pacific without U.S. interference. The shock of the attack without declaration of war enraged the American public and rallied the nation to get behind a war many hoped to avoid. At the beginning of his speech to Congress requesting a declaration of war, President Franklin D. Roosevelt delivered this now famous line. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. On December 8, 1941, 
One day after the attack, the United States Congress declared war on Japan, officially entering World War II. You may wonder why some museums are located where they are. For instance, we've learned that the National World War II Museum in New Orleans is located there because that's where the Allies built their Higgins boats. But sometimes where the museum is located is just as important as the museum. This is the case with historic homes, battlefields, and one museum on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. The Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum is site of our nation's first aviation battlefield of World War II and was witness to the events of December 7, 1941. This museum shares the artifacts, personal stories, the impact and response to the attack on December 7, 1941, and the Pacific region battles that followed. The stories are of the Marines on Guadalcanal, sailors at Midway, and even the story of the Doolittle Raiders in the Battle of Tokyo. In today's episode, we're talking about things mostly in chronological order. There were things happening in Europe and the Pacific Theater and the United States all at the same time. World events don't happen in isolation. When humans were first stepping foot on the moon in July 1969, there were soldiers fighting and dying in Vietnam. In April 1942, you had fighting in both European and Pacific theaters. And on April 18th, the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team won the Stanley Cup championship and Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle led a raid on Japan. This was thought up soon after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. The idea was to bomb Japanese industrial centers to not only damage them, but to also wage psychological warfare and boost American morale. At this point in the war, the United States didn't have bases close enough or bombers that could fly far enough to reach Japan. The idea was for B-25 bombers to launch from and return to an aircraft carrier. Unfortunately, testing showed that the bombers were not able to land back on the carrier. Instead, they would have to drop their bombs and try to get away and land in China. Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle was chosen to lead the attack. 16 B-25 bombers with a crew of five were loaded onto the aircraft carrier, the USS Hornet. Navy ships and aircraft from the USS Enterprise protected them as they cruised toward Japan. On April 18th, these bombers took off when they were 650 miles from Japan, much further than planned because they were discovered and wanted to keep the element of surprise. Of the 16 bombers that took off, 15 had to crash land or bail out because they ran out of fuel. Seven of these brave soldiers were killed in the raid. The result of the raid was not a lot of damage in Japan, but it was inspirational to the United States. The morale of soldiers fighting and those at home is always an important part of warfare. You may be wondering why I'm standing in front of the space shuttle to talk about Jimmy Doolittle and World War II. Doolittle served as an inspiration for service members, including one who earned his wings of gold as a naval aviator and went on to become an astronaut, Scott Tingle. A uh, hero of mine was Jimmy Doolittle. Uh, what a brave man. You know, he's uh, involved in aviation early on. He was uh, aggressive enough. He went to MIT and, and got himself a PhD and then came back and, uh, and led our forces um, on, the, uh, on the Tokyo raid. You know, he flew an Air, an Air Force bomber off of a United States Navy aircraft carrier. And when you want to talk about a team of professionals making things happen, that, uh, that story in itself is, uh, is just so, so amazing. All of the services were involved in World War II. We just heard the story of Jimmy Doolittle's raid, which used Army aircraft launched from a Navy aircraft carrier. You can learn more about the Army at the National Museum of the United States Army. The museum tells the Army's story and honors the accomplishments, sacrifices, and commitment of the American soldiers. This includes the soldiers that crewed the Cobra King a Sherman tank that became known as the first tank in Bastogne. Its crew helped defend the Allied line during the Battle of the Bulge, Germany's last major offensive in the European theater. World War II was fought all over the world and in very different locations. Because of this, there were two surrenders. Japan surrendered in September of 1945. 
But it was VE Day a few months earlier that signaled the beginning of the end of World War II. On May 8, 1945, the Allies of World War II officially accepted Nazi Germany's unconditional surrender of its armed forces, which ended the war in Europe. Today, May 8th is celebrated as VE Day for victory in Europe. VE Day meant the end to nearly six years of a war that saw millions of lives lost, the destruction of homes, cities, and families, and which had brought on huge global suffering. Upon the defeat of Germany, celebrations exploded throughout the Western world. In Great Britain alone, more than one million people flooded the streets in celebration. In London, the King and Queen appeared on the balcony of Buckingham Palace along with Prime Minister Winston Churchill to greet the cheering crowds. In the United States, the day coincided with President Harry S. Truman's 61st birthday. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. Truman dedicated the victory to former President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had died of cerebral hemorrhage a month earlier on April 12, 1945. While VE Day was a day of celebration, it was not the end of World War II. The victory in Europe was complete, but the Allies were still fighting the Pacific Theater. The war against Japan had not yet been won. Churchill told the British people, we may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing as Japan remains unsubdued. President Truman told Americans that it was a victory only half won. The victory won in the West must now be won in the East. Another branch of the services involved in World War II were the Marines. The National Museum of the Marine Corps tell the story of U.S. and world history through the eyes of the Marines. The Marines have served our country from the very beginning in 1775 all the way to present day. The museum puts their primary sources, the objects, in life-size dioramas to show the visitor the context and environment the object had. Their World War II gallery examines the Pacific Theater, where the Marines played a central role. On display is the iconic flag that flew on Mount Suribachi, telling the story of the Marines who fought in the Battle of Iwo Jima. There are amazing museums and learning centers across the country. Our middle school friends are going to introduce themselves and let you know about a museum or connection that their area has to World War II. They're also going to help us learn a little bit about the Pacific Theater and the fighting that went on there. Hi, I'm Sully. I live in New Orleans, which is home to the National World War II Museum and close to the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum. World War II was fought hard in Europe, Asia, and the Pacific. Take a few looks at these maps. The term Pacific Theater includes a large portion of the Pacific Ocean, East Asia, and Southeastern Asia, and many small islands. By 1941, Japan controlled a large portion of this area. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. By doing this, they were hoping to destroy a large part of the United States Navy and keep control of the Pacific Theater. To counter this, the United States and the Allies used a strategy called island hopping. Fighting island by island with each captured island, they moved closer to Japan. This was not easy, and casualties added up on both sides. Slowly, the United States began to retake parts of the Pacific Theater. Hi, my name is James. I'm from Northern Virginia. Not too far from me is the U.S. Marine Corps War Memorial. Iwo Jima is 750 miles south of the island of Japan. It is only 8 square miles in size. It's mostly flat except for one mountain, Mount Suribachi. The island was an important location. If the United States controlled it, fighter planes and bombers could take off from there to attack Japan. It took over a month of fierce fighting to take control of this small patch of land in the Pacific Ocean. A very famous picture was taken of Marines raising the flag at Iwo Jima. Later, this image became the inspiration for the Marine Corps Memorial near Washington, D.C. Hi, I'm Scarlett Langhorst and I'm from Liberty, Missouri. Near here is the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum. The Battle of Okinawa was codenamed Operation Iceberg. This was the largest amphibious battle of the Pacific Theater during World War II. It lasted 82 days and involved the Army, Marines, and Navy. Sometimes the battle is called the Typhoon of Steel because of the intensity of the fighting. Thousands were killed and wounded on both sides. 
This island was important as a staging area for troops, a safer place for Navy ships, and airfields close to Japan. Before Iwo Jima and Okinawa, a battle took place on Tinian that was very important at the end of the war. Hi, I'm Christian from the Fort Erwin Army Base. This base was built at the beginning of World War II and was used for anti-air gunnery training. This is the island of Tinian. It is a part of the Mariana Islands. The Navy bombarded the island and the Marines landed and eventually controlled it. The airfield here was extremely important and was the busiest airfield of the entire war with six long runways that allowed B-29 bombers to take off, including the Enola Gay. These were the only three battles fought throughout the Pacific. There are many more and the soldiers who fought there were unbelievably brave. One of the important ways to preserve history is to collect stories from those people who live them. Oral histories are primary sources, which means that the people who lived those stories are telling those stories. We'd like to give a huge thanks to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans for sharing these amazing resources with us. You can visit them in New Orleans or visit their online collection. There you can find these stories on the profiles section of their website. Let's dig deeper into two incredible stories of World War II from people who lived them. Everything that's happened has got to be told and shown. It's a lesson to be learned. I had tried bazooka, didn't want that. I tried flamethrower, didn't want that. So I went to the company commander and asked him about being first scout. You want to be first scout? I said, yes, I would like to try it. Every night I said my prayers. Once you got in the foxhole, if you dug the foxhole deep enough, you'd be comfortable. We stood up at night and moved around and laid down during the day. Because we were scared. You just live with it every day. You don't think of what might happen tomorrow or something. It's, it's already happened today and yesterday. It, that's always fresh in your mind. Who helped win World War II? It wasn't just us. And who did it at home? It was the girls. I just took off for New York in a bus and stopped along the way to try and get a flying lesson, got to New York. There I met Jacqueline Cochran. She called me and told me I've got authorization to form the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, but I need women with lots of experience, but mostly lots of guts. We were to pick up some planes. They'd been through all they were gonna go through, and they had brought them to the States and we were to fly them over to the place where they would be taken apart to see if there was anything left with them. One time I was on a trip and just knew I was gonna have to land and there was an airport there and they immediately came out and took the airplane in and then they came out and said, lady, you came in on a wing and a prayer they had forgot to put the wrong steel in the valves when it came out of the factory. But I started to cry, I remember. And he said, why are you crying? And I said, I'm crying because I'm thinking of all the other people who went out of the factory this morning with the wrong steel in the valves and might not have made it. All the time that we were in the service, the girls that were killed could not put a flag on their casket. And if a girl was killed, they wouldn't even let them put a gold star in front of the window because she was not a member of the Air Force. And this went on for 35 years that we were nothing. During World War II, hundreds of American Indians joined the United States Armed Forces, and they helped develop codes using their native languages 
Code talkers, as they became known after World War II, were important to helping win battles in the Pacific. Do you think their code was ever broken? As each Navajo word came through the air, the code talker down at the beach command post, he writes it down in English. Send demolition team to hill 362B. Beneath 362B was the problem. 20 seconds in Navajo, 30 minutes in English code. After 20 seconds, Beach Command Post organized a rescue team to save that company in my range. Those guys pinned down on North Side didn't have 30 minutes. That's how critical Navajo code was to the war in the Pacific. I'm joined by Sarah, Aiden, and Catherine. We've all had a chance to read the novel Code Talkers. Can y'all tell us a little bit about the book? The story starts out with a young Navajo boy who goes to a boarding school and they tell him to leave behind his Navajo ways. After they're told that their language and their culture is horrible, then they have to, they're asked to become a Marine to help World War to and be a code talker. The whole rest of the story is about him and his other Navajo friends and other Marine friends going into battle and being code talkers and everything that happened, again, like battling against the Japanese. What did y'all think of the book? It was good. Yeah. I loved it. I thought it was really cool that it was in the perspective of a grandpa who was telling his kids about his experiences. I thought it was really interesting in the story how the main character went to boarding school and his native language was penalized. He couldn't talk it. He, he, he wasn't allowed to use it at all. And then that became a really important part of the story later. What did you all think of that transition from penalty to being so important? I think... Because he was punished, that's why he was so good at being able to speak his language because he's been kind of like holding it in it to speak that language. And then he could like finally speak that language fully and help. I thought it was kind of funny, really, that the people who had told the Navajo people, no, don't speak your language, went from that to... Oh my gosh, we need you guys, really desperately. Did you all gain any insight into the importance of respecting other languages and cultures as you read this book? I think we should make it something that we do regularly so that we aren't like the people at the boarding school and trying to get rid of that uh, knowledge. I just think it's really interesting to learn about other cultures. Because when you're learning about other cultures, you could learn about their traditions and what's different between your culture and the other cultures. What kind of feelings did you have as you were reading this book? And did they change throughout the book? Uh, my feelings definitely changed throughout the book. From going to the discipline at the boarding school to fighting. I was really excited during most of the book. There isn't really a break from the excitement and the danger. I remember telling my parents, no, I can't go to bed yet. This is the most exciting part. <laughs> and then it kept getting better and better. Yeah. Well, you all did a great job, and we encourage everyone watching to do a little bit more research on the Code Talkers. Either read this book or find some other resources on the Code Talkers. It's an incredible story. And I want to leave you today with the last paragraph the author wrote about telling this important story. He says, the lessons my Navajo friends have shared with me over the years are truly the only reason I was able to attempt this inspiring, important story. A tale that is as much about the beauty of peace and understanding as it is about the pain and confusion of war. The Boeing B-29 Superfortress was a massive airplane 
The name most closely associated with this aircraft is the Enola Gay, but there were over 3,000 of them built. Another widely recognized name of a B-29 Superfortress is Boxcar, which can be found at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. This museum is located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base near Dayton, Ohio, home of the Wright brothers. It is home to rare, one-of-a-kind, historic aircraft, including Air Force One Special Air Mission 26000 used by eight presidents sections of the Berlin Wall and the Boeing B-17F Memphis Bell. Let's take a look at this B-29 Superfortress on display here at the Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center, the Anola Gay. One of the most recognizable aircrafts in the museum's collection is the Boeing B-29 Superfortress bomber Enola Gay. In June 1945, the plane was accepted by the U.S. Army Air Forces. The Enola Gay, along with the B-29s, were built to silver plate specifications. These airplanes were outfitted with improved engines and propellers, and extensively modified faster-acting bomb bay doors, giving them the primary ability to function as nuclear weapon delivery aircrafts. It was named in honor of Enola Gay Tibbetts, the mother of the plane's pilot, Colonel Paul Tibbetts. The Enola Gay dropped Little Boy, the first atomic bomb used in combat August 6, 1945, destroying Hiroshima, Japan. The Enola Gay was then used as the advanced weather reconnaissance aircraft for the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, Japan on August 9th. President Harry Truman announced Japan's surrender on September 1, 1945. The airplane returned to the United States in July 1946 and went to Park Ridge, Illinois until it was donated to the Smithsonian Institution on July 4, 1949. It was stored outside of Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland from 1953 to 1960. The Enola Gay was then disassembled and put into museum storage. It underwent a massive restoration beginning 1984 and was put on permanent public display at the Smithsonian Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center in Chantilly, Virginia when it opened on December 15, 2003. Objects in museums are used to tell stories. Here at the National Air and Space Museum, you can really get a sense of the scale and the size of these objects. Being close to them gives you a perspective and an understanding of how they were used. The U.S. Naval Academy Museum in Annapolis, Maryland is both for midshipmen, students at the Naval Academy, and the general public. The original table and tablecloth that were used to sign the Japanese Surrender Treaty are currently displayed here. The long folding table would have originally been used to eat on in the mess deck of the battleship. In pictures, we can see the tablecloth from the officer's wardroom hasn't been cleaned, with stains and other scuffs still on it. According to the captain of the battleship USS Missouri, about 15 minutes before the Japanese delegation were to arrive, they realized that the table they had planned to use would not fit the documents. The crew scrambled to find a table large enough and then something suitable to cover it, resulting in the arrangement that is on display today. We can see just how large the surrender documents actually were in the context of the museum display of the table, complete with a signed replica of the treaty and a life-size mannequin of Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, who signed the treaty on behalf of the United States. Here's a bit more about Victory Over Japan. Victory Over Japan, or VJ Day, signifies Japan's unconditional surrender in 1945, effectively ending World War II. Coming months after the surrender of Nazi Germany in Europe, VJ Day brought an end to the six years of hostilities. Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii in 1941 resulted in the U.S. declaring war on Japan. Japan's ally Germany then declared war on the United States, turning the mostly European conflict into World War II, which continued for years before the Allies defeated the Nazis in what is now known as VE Day. On July 26, 1945, shortly after VE Day, the Allies issued the Potsdam Declaration, which offered their terms for a Japanese surrender. The terms promised a peaceful government, according to the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. If Japan refused the declaration, it would face prompt and utter destruction. Tokyo ignored these conditions, and in early August, the United States dropped two nuclear weapons, one on the city of Hiroshima and the other on Nagasaki. 
Shortly after the bombings, on August 15th, Emperor Hirohito, recognizing the use of a new and most cruel bomb, announced the surrender, stating, Should we continue to fight? It would not only result in the ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but would also lead to the extinction of human civilization. Representatives of the Allies and Imperial Japan met aboard the battleship the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay to sign the surrender documents on September 2, 1945, which is recognized as VJ Day in the United States. World War II is filled with stories of heroism, amazing technology, and really personal connections. My mom has always told the story of the end of World War II or VJ Day. My grandfather, who served in Europe during World War II, was home on leave. They had just sat down to a big catfish dinner when somebody knocked on the door and said, Henry, the war is over. Come on, let's go ring the bell. And they went and they rang the bell on the church all night long, and they never ate that catfish dinner. You can learn more about World War II here at the Stephen F. Udvarahazi Center, or you can check out the new gallery currently being built for the downtown DC Museum. The new gallery will feature World War II aircraft, artifacts, stories, and new interactive elements to tell the story of how the war transformed modern military aviation. The brand new gallery is currently slated to open in 2025. But don't worry if you can't make it to the museum here. As you've seen throughout the show today, there are learning centers, libraries, and museums near you. We've just mentioned a few today. Look near you and I'm sure you'll find a place where you can learn more about World War II. Find those awesome primary sources and investigate your local history. What places are near you where you can learn more about World War II? Leave them down in the comments section and maybe we'll visit on the next STEM and 30 road trip. Be sure to follow STEM and 30 on social media. We can be found on Facebook and Twitter. And after each episode, we will host a live chat with an expert there to answer your questions. If you like what you see, be sure to subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification.